Um, first of all, thank you very much for coming out and supporting this uh, departmental event. It's one I always look forward to. Uh, although usually I'm not able to uh, make it this year as uh, one of the organizers. <laughs> um, I'm John Pickering, I'm a PhD candidate in the uh, Department of Geography. And uh, before I start, I'd just like to mention a couple of the people that uh, helped out with this. Um, Liam, who you all know as the uh, current president of the GGA and a co-member of the Communications and Events uh, Committee that was started this year. Uh, Jermaine and Deandra also assisted greatly and answered weekend and late night WhatsApp messages. <laughs> um, for those of you who are new to uh, this event, there's a uh, representative from three levels of uh, geography, the faculty, graduate students, and undergrad students. Um, and this year, we, uh, we all came together really well. Um, uh, hopefully there's a few other people I talked to that will just show up. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, the uh, undergrads are uh, represented, I believe, by Sunil and Agnes. I haven't met them yet. Are they? Sunil's here. Great, thanks so much for coming. Agnes is on board. Okay, that's great. Um, you can adjust the schedule uh, accordingly. Um, uh, and uh, they're going to be talking about Black Lives Matter as unveiled in the March on Pride uh, event in Vancouver, I believe. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to learning more about that. Uh, Jermaine, um, fellow health geographer, agreed to come and share her experiences in the field uh, related to uh, maternal health care in Rwanda. <coughs> and uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Andrew Perkins agree to uh, come and do a talk today. He's one of the more popular lectures in geography. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that with authority. Actually, I have two, two friends who um, were trained to get their uh, teacher certificate, and they had Andrew, and they said he was a very engaging and uh, compelling lecturer. So I know firsthand experience. And, yeah, so thank you. And also, Andrew is the first person I met uh, face to face within the geography department. You know, we registered our kids together in August. Yeah, I wasn't in the geography. So I like to think the personal connections forced Andrew to. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I'll stop uh, blabbing on, but uh, thank you very much for coming, and our first speaker is going to be Andrew. Please help me with it. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. So my name is Andrew Perkins. I've been teaching here at SFU for going on three, it's just my third year here now. But I've been connected to SFU for a lot longer than that. I did my grad work here as a PhD student. Uh, and I lived in the Vancouver region. I was actually born just sort of down the street in, in, in Vancouver. Uh, so I've lived here pretty much my whole life. And because of that, I've got a pretty strong attachment to the landscape. I mean, we're all geographers here. We know uh, how landscape is significant in forming our lives. And that's sort of what I want to reflect on a little bit today, thinking about you know, how landscape has shaped how I experience my education here, and now how I try and transfer that passion to up and coming geographers uh, coming through the program here at SFU. And part of that uh, will focus on the fieldwork opportunities that I've had uh, along the way. So I'll sort of start with my undergraduate experience and then move through my graduate experience and where I am now in terms of thinking about how to motivate students and help students learn in the field. So it really is this experience in geography component that I, I want to sort of t uh, touch on today, chat about today. And uh, I'll start with this. This is really my only reference to culture in this <laughs> talk. Uh, so take it while you can. Uh, this is uh, an image that's actually kind of made up. It's not a real painting, but a, a diagram made by another uh, geoscience instructor on the east coast of the United States who's actually quite a prolific social media interactor. His name is Callum Bentley. He's really interested in communicating through geovisualization and trying to get people excited about earth sciences, geosciences through the way the earth looks and representing it well. And you may recognize some of the format of this image from another uh, painter, René Marguerite, who was a Belgian surrealist back in the 1920s. He produced a number of paintings that, uh, the most famous one is actually of a pipe. So this is not a pipe, it's just a painting. Now, I'm gonna 
not do a very good job of interpreting the true meaning of this. Uh, but for me, what I see in this image is the Earth. And so often what we do as instructors in geography, as researchers in geography, when we communicate our science, is we try and sort of visualize and, and transfer that visualization to you guys in the audience. And it fails. <laughs> it doesn't get the true message across of what the actual system is, what the entire scope of it is. And for me, part of that failure is that you're not really experiencing it firsthand. You're not seeing what it's like, you're not feeling it, you're not immersed in it. And so over time, what I've begun to realize is that part of a really valuable experience for geography students, for myself in particular, was my time spent in the field. And most of that related to what's now become defined as this field of experiential learning, right? The idea that you learn best, or at least one of the best ways to learn, is by experiencing the process itself and building up structures of knowledge in your mind. Now, up on the screen here is just a really simple explanation or definition of experiential learning. It includes this idea of immersion. Immerses learners in an experience and then encourages reflection about that experience. So not only are they immersed there, but then they're reflecting on that experience. And so there's been a push towards experiential learning because it's seen as this opportunity for sort of like a whole immersive experience. You can't avoid the learning, in other words. It has to happen. But we also know from a little bit of research done in the field of immersive learning in the field that you can't just drop students into the middle of something and expect them to learn. Expect them to, you know, engage <coughs> with what's there and come out with a full-fledged definition or idea of a process of meaning. There needs to be more to it than that. So how do we go from taking students into the field to capitalizing on that in the best way possible? And so I want to sort of take you through uh, how I've experienced the experiential learning process at different levels and how that's led to me forming how I now teach in the field and where I see things needing to change in the future for my own teaching and likely for the broad field of field education. So for me, this story starts back in British Columbia. Like I said, I'm strongly attached to the landscape. And so you're gonna see uh, this image or video zoom into the interior of British Columbia to the Okanagan. And it's likely that many of you have spent time in the Okanagan if you've lived around here for any uh, period of time. It's a really popular place to go uh, for vacations because it's dry, it's warm, so lots of the people from BC and Alberta head to the Okanagan for their vacations. There's lakes there, it's beautiful landscape. Now, every year when I was growing up, from the time I was about eight until I was about 15, my parents would take us to this small lake uh, just between Oliver and Penticton called Gallagher Lake. There was a little campground there, we would stay there for usually two weeks, and then we would leave there and go travel somewhere else in this area. So we spent two weeks here, every year. And I was immersed in the landscape. I had nothing better to do than to go to the lake that was there, hike around that little mountain that you see there, and really just play around in that environment. And as I grew older, I started to engage with more parts of the environment. So I would go a bit further, I could explore a little bit further, and at one point in this process, my dad introduced me to something called the Great Trek. And he, he didn't introduce it like that. We were camping one night and we were in our little tent trailer and he, just in the middle of dinner said, are you ready? <laughs> I had three sisters, three older sisters growing up. Rough, rough childhood. <laughs> it, was, it was a good childhood, but 
Are you ready? That was his statement. And we didn't really know what he was talking about. And in fairness, we had no idea what was coming. But in his mind, for years, as we had camped here, he had planned to hike up to the top of this bluff. For some reason, that was significant to him, to get to the top and look down over this small little lake. And so he said, tomorrow we're going on the Great Trek. Now, my dad is not a physically fit person. Uh, so I didn't expect that this was going to go particularly well. But the next day, uh, we set off from the campground. We walked out here uh, to the campground store. He bought a, a gallon of water <laughs> in a jug, put it in his backpack and about four chocolate bars. Uh, and he led us down the road, and we came to this point. Uh, and you can't see it on the image, but there's a, a river that runs through here uh, and underneath the road out here. And normally the river is dry, completely dry in the summertime. So we hadn't expected that this would be a challenge, but for some reason, whether I, I don't recall at this point whether there had been a storm or something like that, but this particular day, the river was a raging torrent. And so crossing it was not nearly as easy as he expected it to be. In any event, we took out our shoes and you know, grabbed a few sticks, and he managed to haul his kids across the river. And we met our next challenge, which was this terrace-like feature. And the terrace-like feature appeared to me to be made of sort of like ball bearings, you know, rounded rocks that slid. And so as you climbed up, you slid down about two steps for every three steps you took up. And it was this exercise in futility. But eventually, we made it to the top of this terrace, and we slowly made our way up to the top of this landform. Now, as you know, a young kid, you're not really thinking about the depositional processes that went into making these landforms or created them, but certainly they were, they were obstacles to overcome. And they were part of this big landscape that was exciting to interact with. Now, admittedly, I'm a bit of a, a name nerd. And I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, this area, and not this rock, but a rock immediately opposite the valley, is called Nylon Tin in the original language of the peoples that occupied this area. Now, after people came in uh, and settled the area later, they renamed that rock to McIntyre Bluff, which is sort of what was the popular name uh, for many years. Recently, the local people applied to the BC government to have the name changed back to its original name, which means storyteller, which I think is kind of fitting for what I'm trying to tell uh, today and right now. Now, again, I'm a bit of a name nerd, so in my Geography 111 class, I try and hammer home that, you know, this is actually Mount Burnaby, not Burnaby Mountain. You go to the BC Geogra Geographical Names Information Database, that's what you find there. That's what's on the topographic maps. But that's a one-person fight. <laughs> now, there was much more to this story, and I don't have time to talk about it all, but you know, this environment had a huge impact on me as a kid. I would lay awake at night in, in the tent trailer, and you could hear rocks breaking off the cliffs and falling down onto the scree slopes uh, and into the lake below. And you, you'd have this vision of a rock really just crumbling in place, which was uh, weathering in place at the time. And so that built for me an appreciation of the landscape. It was something exciting. And eventually we got to the top. And I've never forgotten that moment, that great trek. Are you ready right, to, to try and integrate yourself with the landscape, to, to work with the landscape? Now, fast forward a few years to my high school experience. Uh, and I, I took geography in high school, which I understand now is, is getting more and more rare. Uh, but one of the opportunities I had in high school was to go on a field trip to this location. And if you've taken undergraduate geography in BC, you've likely been to this spot. Does anybody in the room know where this is, just by looking at it? Dry Knock? Yeah, this is Dry Knock Earth Flow. So this feature you see sort of snaking its way down. This is the Fraser River here and Highway 1 uh, coming up through it. This is an earth flow, a very slow moving uh, landslide that's pushing the highway and other infrastructure off into the Fraser River. It's been active for uh, centuries. Now, 
It's a sort of a rite of passage as an undergraduate geography major in DC, I think, to go visit this place uh, and, and see what it's like, see the processes in place. But I was able to go here as a high school student. And again, that story, that building of an integration with the landscape was significant for me. We only spent a day here. But I still felt connected to the landscape. I was able to spend time there looking at the processes at work. And I had an appreciation for it. But I still sort of looked at, at geography as sort of this, this hobby. You know, it, was, it was something to do. You could appreciate the landscape by understanding a little bit more. And it wasn't until university that I started to realize that geography was an actual thing that people do. Like, this is something that you could make a livelihood at, which was pretty cool. And that was not built on just an appreciation of the landscape, although that gets people excited about it. It was more built on understanding the processes, right? Understanding that you could look at the landscape and actually get at the processes that work in forming that landscape. Now, in uh, in my undergraduate experience, uh, I don't think, yeah, we did go back to Dry Rock, so I went there again. But we also went to other places. So, uh, sorry, the map is sort of low quality here. But again, in sort of south central British Columbia, just around Merritt area, there is this landform in the middle of the valley right next to Nicola Lake. And we went there uh, in my geomorphology class as an undergraduate. And my professor, gave us the challenge of trying to figure out what this landform was. Now immediately, based on its shape, I already had the answer. Because of course, you know, by second year geography training, you're pretty much an expert. Just by looking at something, you could probably figure out what it is, right? It was the wrong answer. And I, I will always remember the point at which I suggested to my geomorphology professor that this landform was somehow volcanic. And the look on his face was just one of complete and utter disbelief at how I could come to that conclusion. Uh, anyhow, I, I managed to move forward from that uh, definition. But I think this image sort of typifies things well in terms of the field of experience. For me at this point, this was from the actual trip I went on. And so you can see there's sort of a range of students engaging with the landscape here. You know, you've got the, the real keeners, the ones who are right up against the sediment face, pulling things out, playing with the sediment. Then you've got people who are sort of standing back and, you know, maybe feeling it a little bit. And they don't want to get their hands too dirty. You've got people with their hands in their pockets. Uh, and then you've got the person who's still just getting off the bus. Right back, <laughs> making their way there. The, the point is that, generally speaking, we spent about three days here at this bump trying, sampling the sediment, measuring the shape, trying to get an understanding of its context. And it was the people who immersed themselves fully in the experience that ended up getting the best educational value out of that experience. Asking questions of the landscape and of the experts who were there to help us out. Uh, and it was they who who got the most out of that full experience. Now fast forward from my undergraduate to my graduate training here at SFU, uh, where I had the, uh, the pleasure of working uh, with someone who's in this room right now, uh, so I won't comment on, on this in, in too much detail, but I think there was a little bit of, of humor uh, in the fact that when I first applied to the program, uh, I think there were some conversations that likely went on in the background, something to the effect of, I've got this new student, and I've got this study area that no one else wants to work in, because it's so huge and ridiculously featureless that no one else would take it on. And so I was taken as a student, sort of up to an overview of this landscape, not this particular one, but a similar view, and, and shown it and said, you know, this is a big mystery. There's lots of opportunity here. You know, a 7,000 square kilometer area of opportunity, right? Can you tackle this and try and make some sense out of it? And at that point, I mean, I had no idea what 7,000 square kilometers looked like, and that term was actually probably avoided for good reason. Um, at that point, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but it was exciting, right? The opportunity to engage with the landscape and potentially be fully immersed in this big area that relatively little work had been done on before. 
So that's what I did. Over the next four or five years, I immersed myself in the study area every chance I got. Over the summer, spending months driving every single road through the area and mapping what was there. With the expectation that through that immersive process, I build enough knowledge to actually get somewhere and build the story of what happened. Now, those of you who are, are doing graduate work know that this is not where you start, right? You don't start by just dropping yourself in the field. You start by doing a huge amount of reading beforehand, building yourself up with that background information, and then applying that to the landscape itself once you're out there, applying that knowledge. But also opening yourself to the fact that you might learn something new while you're there, something that you weren't expecting, something that might be different than what you, has been written about this landscape previously. Now, the idea of full immersion isn't really something new. Scientists have been doing this for years, and in fact, it was once really the only way you could do field work in physical geography, just because of the effort required to get out to some landscapes. And I had a field assistant at one point uh, who encouraged me almost on a daily basis. My research was, uh, in this particular case, looking at the glacial history of the interior on the Fraser Plateau, that, that map you saw earlier. He encouraged me on almost a daily basis to think like the glacier. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that meant to him, uh, but I think from what I could pick up, it meant, you know, be slow, be methodical, be, uh, take on some of those characteristics, immerse yourself, and imagine how the glacier would have impacted this landscape. And in fact, you don't have to go too far back in terms of glacier research even to see how people interacted with the landscape through full immersion in the past. So this is Franz Joseph Hugli. He was doing research on glaciers uh, back in the 1800s and was in fact, his, his observations were some of the first to confirm that glaciers actually move. Right? These were not static landscapes, but ones that were moving across the landscape, transforming it, exerting force, uh, and uh, changing the way that landscape looks. So you can see an image of him here, actually, in a hut that he had built in a medial moraine on one of these glaciers, existing there, immersed in the landscape, spending days and weeks there recording observations. And this led to some groundbreaking understanding of how, how glaciers work. So surely, we should be able to go to the landscape, immerse ourselves in it, and you know, come up with some similar, similar results. All right, so, uh, how am I doing for time? I'm supposed to be done at like 11.30 or something. Uh, we're good. Really great. All right. So, <laughs> I can't remember when we started, because we started just to keep going. All right. Uh, so I wanted to sort of introduce you to some of the highs and lows along the fieldwork path that I had. Uh, while I was doing work uh, in the interior. Uh, so you can see from this image where we stayed. Uh, it's not a, a super high quality image here, but it's, a, it's an old log cabin. Right behind it is this beautiful, large, stately house. <laughs> this cabin was the original cabin at 51 Mile on the uh, old Yale Road, that went, the Yale Rag Wagon Road that went up uh, through the interior of British Columbia. Uh, it's called Kelly Lake Roadhouse, and it's the original structure that stood uh, in that area. And we were privileged enough to stay in it. We had the opportunity to stay in it. Now, it wasn't fancy, uh, but it did the job in terms of structure. Inside, there was a nice wood stove. Uh, you know, there was a couple of, of wooden beds. There had been electricity refitted into it so we could recharge our laptops and so on. Uh, and actually, there was some uninvited guests. Actually, I think we were the uninvited guests in the cabin at the time. Uh, up the loft here that neither me or my field assistants ever had the courage to go up, up into, uh, there was, I think, a mouse that lived up here. Uh, and we slept below the loft, and at night you could hear him scratching around up there and dropping 
thing and slept on the floor. So needless to say, I, I consistently slept with my sleeping bag over my head uh, underneath, uh, underneath that law. But we were fully immersed. We were there for months at a time. And it was during this time that I realized that the field experience was not just for me, but it was also for my field assistant. And it wasn't just me who was learning about the landscape, but it was also me interacting with the field assistant, helping them to learn a little bit more about the process of understanding physical geography. And this was my sort of first taste of teaching in the field, understanding how to communicate what I was seeing to someone else who was there with me or alongside me. Now, what I found out about that was that, you know, we choose field assistants usually based on their academic qualifications, not necessarily their proficiency in the field. Uh, and so there may be some issues sometimes with how those people behave or what their expectations are uh, in the field. Now, the transportation we had uh, going around the field was kindly supplied by the university. This was the old SFU two-wheel drive F-150 that I first learned about uh, in terms of how really tough Ford makes trucks. I mean, you could put this thing to hell and back and it would survive. In fact, I'm sure it's still somewhere driving around. Uh, and we did. We, we took it everywhere. Uh, in case you're wondering, this sign says no passing on the uh, solid white line. I'm not really sure where the solid white line is on that road. Uh, but we did take these trucks everywhere. And to some, sometimes to the great surprise of, of my field assistant, drove them to places that it seemed like the truck physically would not fit. Just because we needed to get to places to see what was there, and they were too far to walk, too difficult to get to uh, in any other way. And I know these, these images don't look all that striking uh, from the comforts of a lecture hall, uh, but shoving a Ford F-250 into sometimes very, very small, narrow passageways uh, can get quite difficult at, time, at times. And I'm glad BJ isn't here because uh, most of our work was spent actually on preventing the truck from getting scratched uh, by the trees that were right next to it, uh, rather than uh, focused on the field work. Right in any event, this all takes a mental toll. You're out there day after day after day. Your field assistant is driving, or you're driving, you're trying to find new sites, there's pressure to produce results. And some of that you feel, but some of it your field assistant also feels, right? They're not there just to work. They're there to support your research. Oh yeah, and sometimes the truck gets stuck and you're miles away from uh, the closest ranch. And it has to be pulled out by some people uh, that you were able to phone. Uh, and, yeah. Thanks. Part of that is to encourage your field assistant that they're part of the bigger picture. That this work would not be possible without them. In other words, you wouldn't be able to get to your goals and establish the significance of those goals without their participation. So you become part cheerleader in this effort for your field assistant. And that's exactly what happened. Now, in this particular instance, we'd set up camp. We were now moved away from that cabin I showed you earlier. Uh, we were camping out, and there's the old field truck. And a storm was coming, so we had set up some tarps. And like any good camper would do, I wanted to make this tarp you know, as strong and as taut as possible to protect our tent from the rain. So I figured, you know, after I tied the knots, I'd just pull the truck forward a little bit to increase the tension on the tarp. What I hadn't realized uh, was that my field assistant had put his boots under the truck in order to keep them dry. And so I ran over his boots. Now, at first glance, you know, for those of you who are saying, you know, this is probably not a big deal, right? Somebody drives over your boots. These happen to be the only boots the individual had uh, with them. Uh, we were you know, miles away from civilization, so getting some new boots was definitely out of the question at this point. This was mentally taxing, like almost to the point of breakdown for the individual. And it's understandable. I mean, you're spending months out here, away from normal social interaction, probably with one or two other people at most, and something like this can be enough to really push you to the point where you just can't handle it anymore. 
Now we were able to move past it. He forgave me for this incident, thankfully. Uh, and we kept on going. I can tell you more stories about, you know, food and maggots and, you know, all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, testable moments in your experience. But the point is, out in the field, when you're engaging with others and trying to bring them along to an understanding of process, when you're going with root of immersion, you need to be a cheerleader. You need to be someone who's encouraging and leading along, showing progress over time towards that goal. And so those experiences led me to understand some of the challenges in bringing students forward in the field in terms of their learning experience. Not just dropping them in and saying, okay, go, but supporting them from multiple avenues. One of those being uh, mental uh, health and understanding you know, the challenges that exist. Now, some of you are familiar with this uh, abbreviation SCOTL. It stands for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. And there's been a huge amount of research done on how students learn in the classroom. And of course, there's recently been backlash against things like lecture environments and you know, acting as the uh, sage on the stage sort of thing. These are all arguments that you've likely heard of before. But there's surprisingly little research done on how students successfully learn in the field, what challenges they face, how they interact with the information they're receiving, how to properly place them or contextualize them in the field. And I would argue that we really sort of exist sort of on this spectrum of observation to participation. So students are either kept in the field and are just there to observe and listen to the instructor, or they're fully fledged in participation, you know, participating in looking at what they see in front of them, experiencing the landscape. And they move from dependency to autonomy where they're dependent on the person teaching to the point where they're dependent entirely on their own resources. Now, some of you are closer to this autonomy stage. If you're in your PhD stage of research, hopefully you're close to being able to define problems, go out and look for solutions on your own. But at the undergraduate stage, where do the students exist? Are we actually moving them in this progression? Are we able to do that well? What does that actually look like? So for me, that's come to this stage where I now see significant components of moving students in this direction as establishing some pre-information, giving them a problem to work with, giving them an opportunity for self-discovery in the field, and then an opportunity to put that information into context and submit it for assessment. Now, this is where the real struggle lies. How do you assess field work? The lecturer in me says, well, you just look at their field report. At the end, say, OK, what did they write? Did they get it? Did they put it all together? But any of those of you who have taken a field school before, have been immersed in the environment, know that by the end, you're probably so exhausted and potentially fed up with that field experience that you're never even going to read the comments that your instructor leaves for you in that assessment. And you might accept the grade, but... So how do we then structure assessment so that we can have impact along this journey? And really, it's not just the post-information that becomes important, but the journey itself, the students learning through the journey itself. How do we support them through that entire path? Well, for me, it really needs to start with formative assessments. Understanding where people are in their journey along that process of getting to the final goal. And for some, that's a struggle because they don't understand how they're being assessed in the field. What's the expectation? Is the expectation I'm just going to complete this process and hand in a field report? Or am I being evaluated along the way? Is summative assessment the end goal really the best assessment here? So some students struggle with this. Some students struggle with the actual purpose. What am I really doing here? Is this just something I'm participating in along the way? Am I just a cog in the machine? And then finally, when we focus too much on being the presenter and less on receiving the feedback or stepping back as the instructor, they don't really get that immersive experience. So trying to step back and give the students the experience 
rather than focusing on transferring knowledge uh, as the sage on the stage. So you become part cheerleader, part guide, part resource, part facilitator of safe spaces in which to work to try and support students through that entire process. And this has really impacted my teaching approach. Even in the short time I've been here, my understanding or thinking towards field work has changed significantly. To the point where, you know, rather than having students going in multiple directions, <laughs> you caught the two students there facing each other. <laughs> they weren't properly instructed on how to use a <laughs> shallow, shallow water and they're both wearing like this. Uh, what are we working towards? Giving students a solid goal, finding the level that they're at and appealing to that level and being very clear up front on expectations. What is expected for them to accomplish at the end of their time? And through this whole process, supporting them with feedback, being that cheerleader, but in a way that it's constructive and critical so that they can actually learn from their results. Positive spin-offs of this are that you can sometimes see some amazing leadership skills developing during these field experiences as you cheer on some of the students and they end up cheering on and passing that on to other students. And I would argue that really this happens best through that process of immersion. Really uh, getting students into the field for longer periods of time, allowing them to integrate themselves with the landscape, fully experience it, is really what's necessary here to take advantage of these processes. Now, just to wrap things up, so I'm, I'm almost done with the expectation so far. Going back to Nyland 10. McIntyre Bluffs. So Gallagher Lake, that place I talked about at the beginning of uh, my talk here, is just at the base of this cliff here. Little did I realize as an eight-year-old that I would come back to the Okanagan, you know, 20 years later, and my study area would be just to the north of this, and the glaciers I was studying were directly associated with the formation of a, a lake that has been reconstructed, an old glacial lake that has been reconstructed in the Okanagan Valley. An ice dam that held that lake back existed right at the location of this block. So it all tied back together for me. It was really strange to find out that this place I had such an attachment to as a child now became something so significant for me in my research later on in life and tied back in terms of understanding how the landscape developed. It was only really through the process of immersion and being able to experience that landscape fully as a kid and go back to it now that I can appreciate some of the larger scale processes at work that still get me excited about going there uh, as a lecturer today. Right. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense where I was going with that is really that field work requires some amount of immersion, being fully immersed in the landscape. And students benefit from that immersion most when they're given the opportunity to experience things for themselves, they're supported with the proper resources, and they're not just assessed based on what they put out at the end, but along the entire pathway through their experience. That's all I got. But in my haste to kick everything off, uh, I have to apologize. I completely neglected the most important part of the introduction, and that was to acknowledge that we uh, work, study, and live on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish, Sotheby, uh, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. Much apologies for that. Uh, Jermaine is next. that uh, me and John have had a lot back and forth between deciding who should do this talk today because as part of the organizers we were like, well, we have to find someone else. In the end, we couldn't find anyone on time, but John, I tried to convince John that he should do it and he was convincing me that I should do it and in the end he won, but uh, <laughs> I still believe that I'm convincing arguments, but. <laughs> so I'm just meant to say, what do you do to John? Uh, I should just start to open it over here. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I'm saying uh, my name, and I do, I'm doing a PhD in geography, obviously. And I work with Barry Cooks, she's my supervisor, and but Nadine is also on my committee. And my search, my research is based in Rwanda. I'm, uh, I'm originally from Rwanda. And before I start talking about, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought I would just uh, start with a, a quick short uh, video to show you um, Rwanda and so that everyone would have a little bit of uh, perception of, of, of what I'll be talking about and where my is at. Of uh, access to 
health services for women who are pregnant or during the, that period of pregnancy, before that period or after, right after that period. So I look at the experiences of women, um, what kind of services are available to them in their communities, but also I look at the experiences of uh, people who are involved in pr providing that, uh, those kind of health services to women. So the, my research participants are women uh, who receive uh, services from, from the, the community health workers, and these are the individuals who are um, selected within their communities. So for, uh, for each village of about 100 households, they elect one person, one woman, who is going to be in charge of uh, providing kind of follow-up to women, knowing what kind of services they should be uh, getting to the health facilities, what, what time they should go, giving them reminders. It, these, are, these are the, the people who are available ac across the country, so it's a program that's um, integrated in the health system in Rwanda, but it's mostly um, people in rural areas who use these women, these uh, services from community health workers. So the, the picture on the, picture on, um, on the right is about um, a community health worker giving um, information, the, the information session in a, like a, during a community gathering. So what the community health workers do, they, uh, they, they, they follow the day-to-day -day lives of people in their communities. So um, sometimes they give information during community uh, gatherings, community meetings. So in Rwanda, there's different uh, opportunities for people to come together as a community. And uh, one of the, the most really common is uh, during the, uh, the community cleaning session. So every last Saturday of the month across the country, they have these uh, cleaning sessions. So there's nothing going on. There's not, everything stops from 8 to 11 in the morning, that last Saturday of the, of the month. So people go in each community, they, they decided where they should be doing the cleaning. And after every cleaning session, that's where there's an um, opportunity for people to have a meeting, come together, talk about what's going on, um, uh, whether there's a campaign going on about maybe education or nutrition or election coming up. So um, the, 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 that's like the kind of opportunities where people come together to talk about these issues. And at every session, they have to have a community health worker talking about any health issue going on. Maternal health is one of the issues that they always talk about, so it would be it to remind women about using health facilities because it's one of the things that really the government of Rwanda is trying to encourage women to, to, to use health facilities for delivery because uh, that's where they have uh, skilled prof uh, professionals to help them. But also, the the community health workers, they do house-to-house um, -house visits. So one, they, they deliver their services to communities through, through gatherings, but also they are also to, to go to house-to-house -to, -house to, to see who, is, uh, who, who needs what services, either by themselves going just to, maybe because they know this family, they have a baby, and to look after to, to see what's going on with the baby, also what, what with the mother or women or other people, community members, they can call them to tell them, I have this issue, I want you to come and tell me what's going on or how I should handle this. So these community health workers, I should mention, they are volunteers in their communities, so they do this role, they're not paid, but they have to, to be on a 24 hours um, area to provide these kind of services. So it can be a challenging, work, uh, a challenging role for these people to do the, the, to provide the services because they're not paid, but also because uh, the community expect a lot from them because they are the ones who link them to the formal health, health sector. So for uh, for my my my, uh, my experiences, I've uh, mentioned two more things that I would say that were part of my uh, my experiences. One is related to um, the opportunity I had to work in Rwanda as a Rwandan because I'm from there, I grew up there, did my undergrad there. So I'm familiar, pretty much familiar with the, the culture, the country. So these are the things that I understand. And when it came up with the, in the discussions with my participant, I was able to know what they are talking about, understand what they are talking about, which I found that was, uh, it put me in a position of ease in terms of uh, doing this research that I was doing. Another advantage I would say that I had for, uh, for doing this study is uh, the next year or so, we have to do it and also back right so then we get a big five and then we'll start to do
should have been there. <laughs> so another familiarity, another advantage I had doing my research is my familiarity with the health system. So I worked in Rwanda for some years. Um, when I finished my undergrad, I worked in a hospital, and my role was to to actually to, to be uh, I, I was a coordinator of community health activities. I was working closely with community health workers. So for me to do this research that I'm doing. Um, and knowing what's happening in the health system, knowing what channels to go through when uh, I need to go to talk to participants was a really another advantage that I would say that I had that really helped me to understand what was going on, to know, uh, I mean, not everything obviously because I, now I did this far, but also it was a really, um, it's really a good opportunity for me to keep following up and knowing even what has changed in the system and how things are being adjusted in terms of uh, what's happening there and how it's, it relates to my, my research. So one of the pictures is, uh, is this one is um, the how in the, the, the like an image of how it looks like in the waiting areas when uh, women go to to the health facilities, which is uh, and. Um, something that's related to one of the things I'm interested in to look at what, what kind of experiences these women face when they go to health facilities because it, it's, it's not just the, the fact of getting there but what happens when they get there if they have to spend I don't know how many hours waiting in the, uh, for them to be seen by a, a, a doctor or a nurse. So these are the, th the things that um, even though they're not necessarily related to my research but helped me to keep understanding what's happening in, in, in the context of my research. And the, the picture in the middle is a picture of a hospital in the northern country. Like you saw uh, in the video, it was not a good, uh, very good image, but uh, Rwanda is a really uh, mountainous and hilly country. Everywhere is, uh, is a mountain. And uh, it, so getting to these hosp hospitals can be challenging. And it also back to the waiting area that the other picture is, um, uh, is uh, I took it from a health center, which is a kind of like maybe I'll say a community, uh, the, the primary health health care center for where people get primary health care. So when the mothers or the, the parents are waiting, the kids when they don't go to school, then they're just paying and they at the hospital and wait there for their parents to 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 be done with the health uh, facilities and then go home. So that's what was, um, I just mentioned that in terms of how I was, uh, I understand these kind of dynamics in terms of my research and how they, it helps me to understand, uh, to interpret what uh, I was talking about or what comes in the conversation with, uh, with my, my participant. The other advantage or opportunity I had when I was in Rwanda, uh, my supervisor Barry Crooks came to Rwanda. And I have to confess that when I'm in Rwanda, because I'm, I'm, I'm from, from there, I'm familiar with there, I don't go to TripAdvisor to see what's new, what is <laughs> <laughs> in Rwanda. <laughs> no, first of all, but I should do this. So we went to visit, um, during various visits, we, we toured the country, went to different uh, health facilities and health institutions and nursing schools, just for her to have an understanding of uh, the health context of the country or the community, uh, the communities that would be studying, studying. But also for me, because it was a way for me to to reconnect with the communities that I have maybe never visited or the ones that um, uh, I have visited in a, in, a, in a long time to see the changes, what has, what's new, what, ha what hasn't changed. All those things were important for me and for Gary to have this perspective to really understand what, what was coming from, from the, the participant information that we're getting. So back to TripAdvisor, trip I'm not sure if that's where you got it, Gary, but I'm sure you, we got it from somewhere, thanks to doing Gary. It was, um, this is a women association that we visited in Eaton Kigali, so I never heard of this association. But they are really amazing in terms of showing people uh, about, uh, like, um, about their lives in Kigali. So they do city tours in Kigali for tourists, and they do cooking sessions for, uh, obviously, for, for tourists. But they also provide uh, webbing sessions, so we did uh, two hours of webbing, and the result was earrings and the poster for Mary. <laughs> That's a proof that we did it. So they also have uh, um, a, a, like a shop where they, 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 they sell the products, they, they make the handmade products. But the, 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 the main 
point of this visit was that um, during the discussions with the, these women, the members of the asso association, we found that uh, one of the association member, members is actually, was actually a pregnant woman uh, working there. So we, I had a, a chance to schedule an interview with her and talking with her was, um, and there was also one, uh, one of the, the association members, they told us that there was also a community health worker who is a member of the association. So I managed to, to schedule interviews with the two, the two lovely women and having the opportunity to talk with them really was a really great advantage for me because not now knowing what they do, what their day to day looks like, it put me in a really good position in terms of conversing with them and knowing how their day looks like, what, what they do um, at home, how this by being part of the association means to them, means to, to, to the pregnant woman, how that benefits her family or for the community health worker, what are her responsibilities working with all these women and having to this role of uh, an association member, but also this role as a community health worker who is in the middle of all these women where she has to provide this ongoing education informally to her association members. So I would say that those are mainly some of the highlights I would say were related to the advantages or the opportunities I had uh, working, working in Rwanda and the familiarity I had with, uh, with the country, speaking the language, being able to interpret what, uh, uh, what was coming up from the interviews, knowing how to behave with women in terms of what's culturally acceptable, what's not. So those kind of dynamics were really important for me in terms of doing my research as, as a woman. But it doesn't come with the vaccine against challenges. So I had challenges, obviously, like I understand the, the first one is uh, really the physical accessibility. So like you saw in, um, in, the, in uh, the video and uh, uh, from the pictures, you can see how um, the geography, the physical geography of Rwanda, the, the mountainous landscape of the country can make it really, uh, it's good for pictures for sure, <laughs> but it can be uh, a big challenge to, na to navigate, especially in rural communities where um, the, the, the accessibility by car is hard. So uh, for my interviews for, uh, for my, with uh, some participants, they, they happened in a location that was uh, they, they are choosing. So some pre preferred me to go to their houses to interview them and others have, um, wanted me to, to have the interviews uh, with them at the, the health center because maybe they had already uh, planned to, to, be, to be at the health center. But for those who, who wanted to uh, to have the interviews in their homes, where I had to go. Sometimes it was really uh, hard to get there, so by car, I would say, because they live there, obviously there's a way to get there, but uh, um, where I couldn't get by car, I would just park the car, maybe mostly at the, the health center, and then had to walk, to, to walk down here or up here to, to get to this, uh, these houses. It was, uh, I would say that it's a challenge because it's hard to get there, obviously, but then at the same time, it was a reminder for me to put myself in the, in the, in the place of those women who have to go to these distances on a day-to-day -day basis. Day -to -day basis. Uh, most, of, most of the cases, for, at least for the ones I was talking about, the pregnant woman, eight months or nine months, having to go to the health center, using this kind of um, uh, roads to go to the health center on it. Uh, you know, it, it's their daily lives. It's sometimes they have to go in the middle of the night in the dark. So this was really important for me to do it in a way that even though it was challenging, but it was a way for me to keep really understanding what, what it really means to, to live there and to have to access health, health services or even other services in this kind of uh, situation or conditions. And not only for women, but also for, um, for community health workers. Like I mentioned, they, they have to navigate all these communities. They, they, they do home to home, house to house visits. So, um, because every community health worker, they have their, um, their area of, the catchment area of houses where they, they, they provide services. And sometimes it's, it's far away. It has uh, maybe 20 minutes walking distance. And this is something that they have to do in the, they have to find some time, some free time to do this role because if they work um, at the school or they have they work in their own farm, they have to have some free time, spare time to do these house to house visits. 
So it's, it can be also challenging to get to different houses and navigate all these uh, different houses in the communities. So it was really um, a way for me, even though I knew I know it, of course, because I'm from Rwanda, I was born there. But it was also a good way to to have that kind of uh, immersion, coming back to see what it really is to to live in this community and to access maternal health. Such as the context of my research for for people living in these communities. And um, the other the, the next challenge I would say was um, the fact that I was working uh, not only with, uh, with, uh, in rural areas, but mostly this was uh, something that I found out um, was kept coming especially for uh, um, disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged communities where uh, as a researcher, not necessarily because I was coming from the city or because I, 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 um, uh, because I was connected with the people from the health center, but the fact that I came to these people, asking them about their their situation as uh, as um, the experiences of maternal health, it put it put me in a position where my participant thought that it, whatever I'm talking or whatever information I'm getting is gonna benefit them for some sort in the future. It can be maybe it doesn't have to be next month or next year, but it, there was there was this um, understanding in some research communities where. You as a researcher, you go and people expect you to to like the, to be the link to whatever is going to be the outcome, the positive outcome of your research that's going to benefit them. So uh, when I was doing my my interviews, I gave um, the token to participants was mostly either a kilo of rice or or, um, or sugar just to appreciate their time, but. Um, not only people expected, expected that there's going to be some benefit by participating in the research, but also the fact that there's something that they're gaining from participating was uh, um, a way for some people to feel like, why are they left out? So for people who are not uh, participants of the research, they, there are people who came asking me to interview them just for them to benefit from that rice or that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that sugar, which is it's, it's really, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that most, uh, most people, most researchers find it, especially doing interviews or having this connection with participants. Uh, it's, a, it's not necessarily a bad thing because you, you will be able to, to interview them even though they were not on your uh, part of your sample, but in a, in a village of a thousand, uh, um, a hundred households, there's definitely going to be more than ten women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. So, they, it could be easily people who would say, oh, I can also be part of research, I have a baby, uh, so I qualify to participate in your research, so can you interview me? Just come in to ask me personally to interview them so that they can benefit from whatever's going to be the benefit from the research, but also have that rise. So for me, as, um, as this, uh, again, as uh, being, understanding those kind, kind of culture um, dynamics, I wouldn't just say, okay, I know this woman just wants the rice, so I'll just give them, them the rice. That would not really be appropriate. So I had to interview them and I value their time, even though I, it, sometimes I'll be really tired, say, okay, I've had six, five interviews here, so I don't need to really more. But I'll get something from this in that interview for sure. But also I have to appreciate this woman who comes and wants to talk to me and also want to benefit from, from that rice. So I found that those kind of um, um, dynamics were a bit challenging. I don't know if I don't know what would be the right word to use, but it would be like I would definitely say that it's kind of creates some uh, a challenging situation for you as a researcher to know that there's something that the participant expects from you in a way that is going to either benefit them directly or indirectly. And um, the next challenging. <laughs> situation is the nature of my research. For me, talking about, um, not the nature of my research, but the specific uh, research that I'm doing, talking to, to women about maternal health. The first question I get, not necessarily the first question, but the, the question that we come every single time is, do you have children? And I say, no. <laughs> are you married? I say, no. <laughs> okay, how old are you? <laughs> those, <laughs> those three questions we always, always, either at the beginning or in the middle or at the end, but they will come, the three of them. 
like one for one. So having to explain that I can talk about maternal health without necessarily having a child was a bit, um, it's not, and again, it's not a challenge because I'm, I'm really prepared that this question is gonna come. And uh, the, the expression that I had from people with different the facial expression when I, I said no to no, all those questions, they say, oh, okay, so you're in school. So yeah, it's good that you're in school. It's better that you finish, but most would be like, oh no, 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 that's no. You have to have a <laughs> Yeah, it's good to be in school, but you have to think about it. So yeah, yeah, I'm talking about maternal health as an expert about maternal health, but then I'm the one being lectured about how I should actually <laughs> practice maternal health. So that's, um, yeah, that's what's quite interesting for me. Um, and uh, it's a really fair question, I imagine, for anyone, if you ask about maternal health um, experience to anyone. I think it's a fair question to be asked if yourself you have a child. But going on and on and on about uh, like, what you should do and whatever, I found it was, uh, I, I put it also in the category of um, my, me being uh, part of their culture. I think they felt that they entitled to tell me what actually happens in our culture, what, that what's acceptable for a woman, what's expected for a woman, my age, my, <laughs> my, my, um, my status that is expected to have a child. So that, uh, that was quite interesting and I imagine that as much as I go in this research, if the situation doesn't change, I'll be getting the same question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so finally, I would um, also talk about the fun time that we had. Um, it was a really fun experience, interesting. I read a lot and even though I'm from Rwanda, every time I go, I learn something. I gain new experiences. And it's sometimes challenging. It's um, but it's also fun. So sorry, <coughs> was in Rwanda. We had um, we took some some time. We went to the national park, the one that they pictured in the video. It's in the eastern um, part of Rwanda. So I, I thought of putting this video, and I, I expect that as geographers, it's uh, it's not as uh, people who are not geographers. Sometimes one of the misconceptions that they have. I already know that uh, for geographers, not the same. But um, one of the misconceptions about Africa is that when you ask someone, what do you think of Africa, of Rwanda, whatever, they say animals. So they think that you cross the street and there's a, a lion. They say, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have to pay actually to go see these animals. And in some cases, can be really expensive. <laughs> so this park was a three hours drive from, from Kigali, from the capital city. But once in the park, you drive about five hours to you know, get through the park and see see where the animals are, depending on what day, what time of day, and where they are. And uh, we had the driver who is also a tour guide, he knows where they hang out, which ones, and uh, he showed us the animals, and it was really a uh, really great time to be there and to experience it. But we didn't send sea lions, and I hope next time they will see them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it about my experiences. Field work, I think, takes you beyond the mindset of the classroom 
and out into the real world where you can observe empirically how things actually function and work. So in Germany, when we, I was there with my class, this is a different class, um, we toured Dortmund, Essen, Cologne, and Dusseldorf, among other towns, where we were shown firsthand how a coping plant, industrial mining, and filtration project worked, and saw how underground mitigation strategies worked in case of a flood disaster. Um, we also attended a conference where we mixed with German classmates over presentations and group projects, and this was the best part of it that I liked, the social aspect of mixing with the locals. We also had a chance to visit various tourist venues, such as a church, a museum, a chocolate factory, pubs, and different shopping districts, not to mention taking in a local music festival um, and also participating in a river cruise down in the country. Um, I loved learning on my feet. This was really different from just writing and reading about something. And it felt like both work, but also a study vacation. <laughs> so my job guided um, was a small scale, but even so equally inspiring uh, to attend as a movement. The goal of the, our research was to experience and document the event in the form of words and images on poster. Um, for a class uh, on gender that was led by Deandra. Um, I think it matters because even as students, I think it is important to incorporate experiences beyond the classroom into our educational record because it shows that we care to understand how processes work outside of the university experience in campus. Um, we approach the event in a three-person group. There's just two of us today. Um, and I experienced firsthand what it was like to participate in a live social movement. I thought I was prepared to experience the event as an observer, but words cannot describe what it was like to mark the crowd. Um, I was excited, scared, and overwhelmed by the rallying, the chanting, the marching down the street amidst other participants engaged in extremely high spirits within the movement. Um, it was interesting to observe different, um, how do I say this right, L L LGBTQ groups coalesce and combine to form a force of nature, many of which can be identified by their outfits and manners. Dif different participants of various demog demographics, including persons from gender, racial, and ethnic backgrounds, emerge with solidarity to support this movement. It is safe to say that all groups, regardless of orientation, were welcome and equally supported. Um, I was not prepared um, to, to experience a movement in this way that while small and scale still struck with a force that, that was both diplomatic and surging. If I had a chance to participate in the movement, I think I might do it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our really cute poster that, that we found the exact shade of Davy Street pink. <laughs> and, and we bought um, colorful uh, bracelets from the dollar star just so we could be part of this event. Um, yeah, do you want to yeah. go? Yeah, sure. So, D'Angelo was kind enough to uh, give us a couple of questions on how to present. So, to start off, who am I? My name is Neil and this is my second to last term at SFU. I'm a full-time student and I'm doing a major in geography and a minor in political science and a certificate in urban studies. So why did I choose to do a major in geography and why do I consider myself a geographer? For me, I think it was a mixture of things. I've gone to school across Canada. I started here and then I ended up in Montreal, made my way across Canada to Calgary, and then now I'm back in Vancouver. Um, <laughs> And what I found that a variety of my interests intersected in geography, which is pretty cool. So I did psychology, I did biology, kinesiology, kind of all over the map. But I ended up in geography. Um, I've also always been interested in the vibrancy and the cultures of cities that I've lived in and visited. And so I would consider myself a human geographer because I'm interested in how humans interact within a space and place, especially the intersections of where race, class, and gender affect the way people are treated, which is mainly why, for me, I felt that this particular event was important for me to explore. And so, what does that mean for me and my daily practice? For me, I notice that whenever I walk around the city and something sticks out for me, I have that little voice in my head that says, who is it for? 
which Eugene can. Said that all the time. <laughs> um, and so it asks, who is it for? And it makes me question, why was it built that way? Who built it? And what is its purpose? Those kind of questions. It's, and it's given me an appreciation for public spaces, community groups that advocate for spaces for marginalized people, and the way structures are discreetly built. And so what was the field work that we did? So, as Agnes also pointed out, the field work that we did was to evaluate a community event, specifically looking at how accessibility, inclusivity, and reflexivity played out in the event that we attended. So for our group project, we decided to go to the March on Pride, which was hosted by the Black Lives Matter group of Vancouver. The goal of the research, what did we do and where did we go? So the goal of the assignment was to provide a critical analysis of the event hosted in Metro Vancouver using a framework that identified the aspects of accessibility, inclusivity, and reflexivity. So for our group project, we went together to the March on Pride, as we said, and we listened to the speeches and, and spoken word presentations before marching up Davies Street from Emory Barnes Park in Yaletown all the way to Alexand Alexander Park near English Bay Beach. And so why does it matter? The event was specifically important to me as I felt that the concerns of marginalized folks such as queer, trans, and specifically queer and trans black folk were not being listened to in our community. And I noticed that the argument that Black Lives Matter is an American issue is in my view a little bit flippant to the concerns of the people in our own community in the way that to silence other voices that are not the focal point within the mainstream narrative. So reflections on doing some of the field work I thought that when comparing our event and all the other events around Metro Vancouver that the class looked at were great, but I felt that it showed how much thought and care was put into really making sure that everyone felt included, while simultaneously making sure that the voices that the event was intended for were highlighted. So they had, beginning of the event, they had the First Nations uh, acknowledge the land that we were on, and they spoke first, and then after that we had um, black queer folk present and there was some poetry there, there was singing, um, there's a variety of things. They also made sure that people with disabilities, because if anybody's walked down and up Davy Street, it's a bit of a hill, physically, and so not everybody is able to participate in the walk. So they had, I think, two vans that were able to pick up the people who had mobility issues and take them from the beginning all the way to the end, which I thought was great and inclusive. So for me personally, I felt comfortable and welcome, and I had a more authentic experience by completing the research project, which I don't think I would have gotten if I didn't attend the Black Lives Matter March uh, on Pride in person. So, yeah. Big thank you to all the speakers today. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, one more very important uh, element is the pizza. There's uh, some for carnivores, herbivores, omnivores, and uh, hopefully everybody feels satisfied with that. Of themselves. <laughs>